Well, the thing is, we humans can't be happy and whole unless nature is happy and whole. What makes us really happy, apart from our own relationships with each other, is spending time in the forest, in wild forest, in a forest that's brought itself from out of itself. We know now from the science that we need biodiversity to absorb carbon, to produce cloud seeding chemicals, basically to regulate the climate of the earth. We have to have healthy biodiversity. So even from a purely functional scientific point of view, we can make an excellent case that we can't have a healthy human society or a healthy economy or whatever we want unless nature is healthy. We can't. I mean, if we destroy all the rainforests and pollute all the oceans, then what's going to regulate the climate? We are nature. We came out of nature. And if we want to have a healthy psychological life, we've got to have a healthy nature. We've got to have biodiversity, wild biodiversity in nature. So that's why it's very important to rewild. It's important to rewild on two levels, therefore. One is we need to rewild so the Earth, Gaia, can regulate her climate so that we can have a happy life. And we need to rewild ourselves psychologically through rewilding nature. Once we rewild nature, we realize wild parts of ourselves that we didn't know existed. Because when you do that, you start to feel the soul of nature. And the soul of nature is your own soul. The soul of nature is the human soul. They're indissolubly connected. So it's very important to rewild for all those reasons. A warm welcome to our session, Rewilding as a Biodiversity Engine. I'm Guido Boche, Chairman of True Nature Foundation. Our mission is to make Europe a greener, healthier, and wilder place. Bottom up, project by project, always together with the local communities. We just saw a wonderful video capturing the essence of what rewilding is all about. The narrator, Dr. Stefan Harding, research fellow at the Schumacher College is with us in the audience today. We are nature. We came out of nature. So if you want a healthy life, you got to have a healthy nature. You got to have biodiversity. That's why it is important to rewind. Thank you so much, Stefan for your wise and powerful words. And thank you, Sam Chevalier, for producing the video at Rewild TV South Africa and your permission to share it with our audience today. Our session of 90 minutes consists of two parts. In the first one, hosted by yours truly, we bring together three rewilding practitioners from around the globe. In the second part, hosted by my colleague Marijke Brune, we have two rewilding funders, one from the public and one from the private end. Both parts with the practitioners and funders are followed by an interactive 15 minute session with you. Via our chat box, you can send us your questions and comments. If you want to address a question specifically to one of our speakers, please indicate so. You can also respond to the two online polls we will conduct during this session. To do so, scan your QR code with your mobile. The first question is, what comes to your mind if you hear the word rewilding?
Um, so you see the screen now, which you can use uh, to fill in the answers. Um, so if we continue, uh, then um, we really love to see your comments and uh, responses and your questions. So don't hesitate to send them in and get in touch with uh, the speakers and ourselves. Um, so let's move now to the core of our session today, and that is our wonderful speakers. We feel most privileged to present you some truly outstanding rewilding practitioners. First and foremost, the amazing Christine Tompkins, former CEO of Patagonia, the outdoor brand, she acquired with her late husband, Doug Tompkins, over millions of acres of land in southern Argentina and Chile, turning them into vast wilderness reserves, which over time evolved into 15 national parks and two marine parks today. Joining us in the early hours of the day from Los Angeles with her morning tea and maybe her Labrador, we are very honored to have you with us, Christine. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you guys can see me. I, it's hard to say. Uh, Shall I yeah. move ahead? I'm yeah. Werner. There seems to be... I... I'm afraid I There we go. Anymore. I think All that's right. it. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, nice to be here and participate in all of this. Um, my name is Chris, and I'm at the family ranch in California, having come out of Chile very rapidly at the end of March, as everybody was sorting themselves out because of COVID. Um, I'm going to take just five minutes to talk about some of the things we're doing. I'm going to throw a map up here so you have a sense of, of where we work and what we're doing. Um, see if I can get this. Yeah. We have been working largely in the Southern Cone between Chile and Argentina. We, my husband and I, uh, were refugees out of the business life and community and decided to spend the last third of our life um, protecting key habitat and uh, making associations with both governments in those countries to donate them back as national parks for the patrimony of all Chileans and all Argentines. Along the way, about 15 years ago, we realized that in some of our projects, though not all, there were significant species missing. And in some cases, the apex species were missing. And an example of this is uh, jaguars in Northeastern Argentina, which we have begun to work on to bring back <clears throat> in our Ibarra Park project, which is uh, just under 2 million acres of territory. So a lot of that no conflict zone. So it's possible to work on this species. And uh, another example, in the same park, uh, the green-shouldered macaws who have been missing from Argentina for 130 years. And I was telling my colleagues on this talk this morning that we just had the first chick born in, uh, born in the wild last week. So as many of you must know, rewilding has its uh, great days and really tough days, but we have had some great uh, successes with the species. And in Chile, um, the way mule deer was almost extinct entirely in the Andes region and we're bringing that back. So um, let me get out of this and come back to 
um, the, the, the talk at hand. I think it's important to, to mention how, how we look at rewilding. When we, when we first began our efforts, as I said, we were really focused on territory and then realizing that that was, in fact, the creation of national parks is just one of the strategies you have to do what you're trying to do, which is rewilding a territory, bringing it back to its full ecological functional level. And that changed our work profoundly ever since. So rewilding, I know is the term often considered to be uh, just bringing extirpated species back. But in, but in our minds, rewilding has, starts its role at the top. So that's acquiring, establishing uh, large territories where rewilding is possible, putting those territories into some sort of protection that has um, uh, protections around it that will go the distance. It's 100 years, it's 150 years, you know, you can't read into the future. So establishing the territory and then sometimes this is the sea. Establishing the species, doing all the, the pre-work of who's missing and what can we do to bring them back. And then rewilding ourselves. And that's what we call it anyway, because you can't do this kind of work. You can't even uh, champion this kind of work wherever you are, unless you yourselves, the communities, local, regional, national, global communities, agree that our future depends on a healthy ecosystem and you can't have that as was said by the gentleman from Schumacher unless everything is functioning and that's the big problem because every day the conversion of nature to production is winning the race over those of us in conservation who are trying to beat the clock and it, it, it's becoming one giant race to get someplace first. So that's what we do. We work very extensively, especially in local communities. Um, we see that as essential for any sort of conservation work, whether it's just rewilding specific species or protecting land or sea, because at the, at the final, the, the final chapter, the defense of these areas, the defense of the communities themselves comes from the benefits they get from this kind of work and they adopt it, adapt it as their own. So for us, this is really, it's not just a, a personal ethos, it's also a very fundamental structure of conservation anywhere in the world. We see rewilding, and I know Giles Davies is from Africa. He'll be speaking. We all learned this really through African models that rewilding is an economic driver for local and regional communities. And uh, we see this in almost everything we do and uh, we've lived it. And finally, I'll just leave you with this. Our old friend Arne Ness, the Norwegian philosopher, always said that all life has intrinsic value. We can't give them value. They own it. It is theirs to have. And that's really what guides everything we do. The 15 million acres, the however many species and so on. We always come back to that, where are we going? And that is our North Star, the intrinsic value of all life. Thank you, Guido. Thank you so much, uh, Christine. Um, our second practitioner is um, Rebecca Wrigley. Rebecca is uh, CEO of Rewilding Britain 
where she's taking rewilding into mainstream conservation via a very successful rewilding network of uh, landowners. And we love to hear from her. Rebecca, the floor is uh, yours. <laughs> Thank you, Guido. And uh, thanks to everyone. Um, it's great to, to be here and to, to be able to speak with you. It's a shame not to be able to see everyone's faces, but uh, you know that's the world we're living in at the moment. Um, I'm just going to share my screen um, in a second. So I'm just going to give some, some thoughts about what we're doing in terms of achieving rewilding at scale through coordinated local action. So Rewilding Britain, we started five years ago, we're still small. And our role we see is as a catalyst for change for rewilding in practice. Um, to influence, particularly government po po policy, uh, but also engage. So raise awareness of rewilding and uh, help people to take actions to support rewilding. Um, and I suppose a big question is what, what is rewilding? Um, for us, we have five principles. So we start with people are part of nature. We're not apart from it. Um, so we have to consider rewilding and people uh, together and we have to support people and nature together. Um, we can't separate the two and I think that's been a problem in the past. Rewilding is about working at nature's scale um, but that scale can be achieved through large areas or interconnected smaller areas and uh, as an ideal we'd love to see rewilding from people's doorstep, gardens into parks, into river corridors, out into the countryside so it doesn't have to be scale in terms of large isolated areas. And in those areas, um, for me, one of the fundamental things is, is about letting nature lead. It's about reinstating natural processes um, rather than conserving specific species. Um, and that might involve um, reintroductions of species where the, they're missing in the food web and in the tro trophic cascade, but also allowing natural disturbances that creates that functional complexity um, that is sort of rocket fuel for biodiversity. But as, as Chris said, um, that element of rewilding has to be hand in hand um, with people's livelihoods. So it can create huge opportunities um, in terms of nature-based economies, enterprises, forms of production. And obviously we like to see the benefits secured in the long term. Uh, and those benefits, well, you know, we see one of the huge kind of pluses and positive sides and hopeful sides of rewilding is that there are so many benefits. Um, firstly, rewilding can draw down carbon from the atmosphere and we proved in a report um, last year that the extent of that um, could be equal to, um, in, in the UK, about 10% of our current emissions. So it could have a significant impact in climate mitigation. But also, <laughs> It's a big week for, the, for us this week because we've relaunched our website, we've launched the first phase of the Rewilding Network that I'll talk about in a minute, but we've also just launched a report on the role of rewilding in climate adaptation and the fact that climate zones are now moving so fast northwards in the Northern Hemisphere, at least five kilometers a year, that rewilding can help create the kind of habitats and connectivity that allow species to disperse as they have to move because of climate change, obviously hand in hand with that, it reverses biodiversity loss, can support diversified, more resilient eco economies, but also, as, as Chris said um, in the film, it, it's the sort of bedrock of our health and well-being as, as humans. So because of all those things, um, because of the climate emergency, the ecological emergency, we uh, there's a growing realisation that we need to act. We need to act now and we need to have ambition in, in terms of the scale and pace of change. So at Rewilding Britain, um, we're starting now to call for 30% of Britain to be rewilding and in nature's recovery by 2030. That's the scale at least that we need to achieve. But we'd like to see that through connectivity, through creating what we're calling climate corridors, right from, from Cornwall to Caithness, up the spine of the country, down through our river systems and river corridors um, to the coast and, and, and round the sea. And of that 30%, We'd like to see at least 5% as core rewilding areas. So uh, the highest level of rewilding uh, on the rewilding spectrum, but also 25% at least of a kind of mosaic of 
um, nature enhancing land and marine uses, um, a sort of interconnected tapestry um, with stepping stones of, of core rewilding amongst um, other forms of land use like low impact silviculture, some forms of extensive grazing, nature based tourism, of course. Um, and at Marine, we'd like to see our inshore and offshore waters truly protected. Um, so what are we doing? Well, as Gideon said, we are just launching a rewilding network. So we feel that change can happen from the bottom up, from a myriad of different initiatives um, where people are wanting to, to rewild. And we're con constantly now getting requests. How do we rewild from sort of two acres to 20 acres to a thousand acres from private landowners to um, conservation NGOs to public landowners? Um, and we feel that kind of creating that movement and supporting that movement and connecting it up, um, we'll start to see a sort of, you know, a much bigger, we can kind of start it to be much more than the sum of its parts. Um, and so just, I suppose to, whoops, wrong way, <laughs> to round up a bit. I mean, then we see that there are real opportunities for rewilding. Again, starting with that coordinated locally led action. It's a kind of decentralized approach where we can, we're seeing an upsurge in, in interest in rewilding, both for ecological reasons, but also economic reasons. Um, we feel our role is to help catalyze and support that movement for change and to support that myriad of, uh, of initiatives that all will add up to large scale change. Of course, we also need joined up government action. Um, so we'd like to see rewilding mainstream, just a, one of the ways, part of how we manage our, our land and seas. Um, to do that, we need integrated financial and, and regulatory support. And I suppose one of the potential opportunities of Brexit in, in the UK is, for instance, um, changing the common agricultural policy and how we provide incentives for and support land use change. Um, so the replacement for common agricultural policy called the, the Environmental Land Management Scheme has the potential to be quite positive in supporting public payment for public goods, um, which, again, if we get that joined up, integrated approach to land use and marine use and an integrated support for that, I think we can achieve the change that we need. Um, so I suppose that's all I wanted to say, and I really look forward to the discussion that follows. Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca. And uh, wow, I um, I love your program, and most of all, I uh, I love the ambitions of your rewilding Britain organization. Um, so good luck with that, and uh, and and we love your new uh, visual identity, by the way. So good luck with all that. Um, last but not least, our uh, own Luis uh, Martinez. Uh, Luis is our country program manager in Spain, smart guy, great nature lover, and a driven rewilder. So Luis, I would say, take it away. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Guido. That's a great pleasure to be here with all of you. I will try to express also our own view about uh, what is rewilding. If I can find, wait a minute. So all of us gave us our own our own vision of, of rewilding, and of course, the Nature Foundation is not going to be the least. But I wanted to to, to, to start a, bit, a little bit from the beginning. Okay, so what was the, the origin of, of rewilding? Rewilding really the first time that the word rewilding appears in the publicated was in a in a paper written by Sulea Nos in 1998. Uh, they spoke about rewilding as the restoration and protection of big wilderness and wide-ranging large animals. They also spoke about a critical step in restoring self-regulating land communities. And that's the magical word for me, self-regulated. Because if we are talking about restoration nature, nature, by definition, 
must be uh, independent, must be self-regulated. If uh, because a lot of times we go to a natural park, to a national park, and you will hear, well, here we need to fire the the, the grass to avoid the bushes or or to call the herbivores because there's so much, something like that. But well, if uh, human beings need to regulate it, then uh, for me this is not nature because nature must be self-sufficient. But of course, it's very difficult uh, nowadays to get it. So how can we get this uh, self-sufficient nature? in the 21 centuries. Well, um, uh, Sulea Nos expressed it quite well in the famous three seas of rewilding, which were core areas, corridors between those areas and carnivores that today we speak about keystone species, which will uh, run across those areas. Because this is only the um, a natural uh, evolution from the theory of Iceland biogeography, which was written by MacArthur and Wilson in 1967. MacArthur and Wilson realized that little tiny Iceland, as you can see here in this uh, graphic, little tiny, tiny isolated Iceland has a very high uh, rates of extinction and very low biodiversity rate. But in big, bigger islands, or in Iceland, especially in Iceland, which has contact with uh, different uh, other islands, the extinction rates were lower and the number of species were higher. And it can be applied too for uh, protection areas. So we want um, a self-regulating uh, nature with uh, species which can travel and move around, as Rebecca says, to avoid, for example, the global warming. You know, they need to move and they need to look for, for new places. They need also to, to boost the um, ecological system. You know, they need to, to start to work in the evolutionary uh, system. But how can we get it in the 21st century? More or less, the ecological theory is, is all right. But we also need to, to develop in a very populated world. And for this, the True Nature Foundation is proposing also to include something else. Of course, will be the ecological restoration, the rewilding by itself with the, carne, the keystone species, the corridors and the core areas, but also the rural development and the climate change. Why? Because the climate change, um, the, um, a healthy ecosystem can be a very good way of uh, storing carbon in the subsoil. So it can help in the climate change. But also then why do we need to include the rural development? Well, as Chris said, we need to rewire ourselves. And absolutely any um, conservation project never ever has worked in any place in the world if the local community were not agree with it. So what do we need to get it? Well, I'm sorry to say so or not, but to get it, we need to, to work with the local communities, to spend endless hours of talking and chatting and, and calling with the local communities, with the, all the stakeholders, the hunters, the, um, the farmers, the mayors, the gamekeepers, everyone. And we did a lot of time, you, you don't know it very well, we were doing it in Spain, in Romania, in Georgia, in, in a lot of countries, in a lot of places, during a lot of time. A lot of times it's very rewarding and normally it's very funny, but sometimes also always is very, it also is very hard because not everybody likes this kind of, of programs. And we need to make them understand that rewilding is not only good for climate change or for biodiversity, but it's also good for the communities because we are offering them um, a sustainable way of develop of developing their own communities with new your position on, on for example on ecotourism so my recommendation for new rewilders what is well i'm sorry but keep calm practice rewilding speak with everyone because really my friend the greatest impediment to rewilding is the unwillingness to imagine it thank you very much Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Um, great talk. <laughs> I love it. Sounds very familiar too, actually. Uh, but that hardly can be a surprise. We get some very interesting questions in from our audience. Um, and I have three questions in front of me. And uh, I suggest that we start um, putting them in. The first question I would like to address to Christine. Um, and this is a question posed by Nina Schoenberg. 
what are the possible conflicts between actively restoring versus letting nature to regenerate on its own? Um, well, you... it's a very good question. Okay. I think that in some, with our experience, some there are some cases where you can just leave it alone and maybe it's an old estancia, a ranch, and the only thing you really have to do is take the livestock off and let the, in this case, the grasslands begin to reseed over different um, seasons and usually many years, and it can restore itself. But there are other areas where it's just not possible. You have to instigate the restoration. And I'm talking more about landscape now, but um, every area, every project is different. There isn't a, a recipe that you can really follow. It sometimes has to do with local politics. It has to do with national politics. Um, every, every circumstance is very different. It so is. you have to be very flexible in the way that you go around and go about restoring landscapes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, would, would you like to comment on this question as well? Um, yes, uh, I mean, I completely agree with, um, with what Chris said. I mean, we I started particularly, for instance, with, um, we, start, we have a model where basically let nature take care of itself, if at all possible. There are circumstances where you'll need to kickstart that. Um, for instance, with woodland regeneration, there might not be seeds. There are many places in Britain where there are no seed sources for trees. And so you might want to kickstart that through disturbing the ground. Um, and and you know, we, we kind of want to turn on the whole tree planting thing a little bit on its head, because in most places in Britain, you don't need to plant trees unless there isn't a seed source. And then uh, you can often do direct seed seeding or just remove um, herbivores for a while to let let nature kind of take off. So I think I, I agree. It, in many cases, nature's very good at taking care of itself. It's been doing it for quite a long time without our help. Where it needs help, there are some interventions that you can take to kickstart it. And then, you know, if, if the ecosystem is completely degraded, it might be much more active um mechanisms um but fundamentally let's start by letting nature take care of itself okay thank you um a second question uh, coming from um uh, mr binyana i'm actually not sure if it's a mister but uh, binyana pasakala um and the question is do rewilding projects increase human wildlife interfaces causing increase in conflicts um, Chris, would you like to comment on this one? Yeah, again, <clears throat> it really depends on the circumstances. Uh, yes, in Southern Chile, especially where we have not re reintroduced pumas or mountain lions, but they've been persecuted for the last almost century. So their numbers were very, very low in the Southern Cone and, and quite fragile. They're like lions in Africa. They're pursued because of the conflict with, with livestock. And really what we did is stopped in a very, very large area or a series of areas, the shooting of them. And they come back um, pretty rapidly on their own. And so, yes, you do have some livestock predation that, that may go up uh, somewhat. And you do have uh, a lot of people seeing pumas now, which they would not have done 15 years ago. There are a lot of programs that we've initiated on management of livestock and I'm sure most everybody on this panel has had this some experience with this and trying to change livestock management forward toward 
that is more active, I should say. And while wildlife numbers go up, this does not have to mean that your livestock numbers go down. And so it's a lot more work. It's managing livestock the way they did hundreds of years ago before we have our modern techniques. But yes, there are more interactions between wildlife and human populations and livestock populations. Uh, but we consider that to be a good thing. And so with rewilding, you're not just bringing something back, you're trying to figure out how do you eliminate the causes that they went extinct in the first place? Because if you don't do that, or you're not prepared to do that, then you're just recreating yet another extirpation down the road someplace. So that's kind Thank of how you. we see it. Thank you. Um, a, a bit of a similar question. Um, there's an an analogy, I, I think. Uh, it was posed by Chanel Whitting. Um, and the question, uh, I'd like to address to Lewis this time, and um, um, I think it's very relevant for Spain as well, as for so many other countries. But how can rewilding, for example, reintroducing large mammals and agriculture complement each other instead of conflicting? Well, that's indeed a, a very good question, because, well, large mammals, as, uh, as I said, they need a lot of space, of course, and they need to also to migrate, especially in countries like Spain, which are, uh, the, um, the primary production is very dependent on the, on the season. You know, we have a good production on, on spring and autumn, but on summer and winter is very low. So the animals have to move a lot. And it means, as, as Chris said, it's a source of conflict with the people, especially with the, with the farmers. But it doesn't mean that it's completely impossible to do anything. Um, what it means is that people have to change their mind. So we, um, mm -hmm. the place where I'm developing my, my activity is not only mine. I must accept that a lot of things will go on there. For example, the migration of, uh, of big mammals or birds or whatever. But I must understand that it also it can be a, a source of incomes not only for me but also for the, for the for my community because people will go there to see them etc. Of course, um, must I I must be the only one who who pay the protection of my of my culture of my of my cattle of my whatever. Well, in Europe, what we what it's accepted especially in the case of um, of wolves attack, attacks of great carnivores to to livestock is that uh, you in the in European Union is paying these uh, losses to the, to, the, um, to the farmers. Okay, so if a wolf eat your sheep, then the European Union will pay to you. The sheep is, in this case, your, you will not lose very much. And also the European Union will help you to buy, for example, big dogs or electric fences or things like that. So the point is, uh, this is going to, um, to increase the, the conflict. Well, it will increase the conflict in a, in a traditional way of, of farming, in a traditional way of doing things. If I want to release my animals and forget about them during one week, then for sure I am going to have conflicts. But if we adapt to the new condition, if we ask the government for help and the rewilders, because that's why uh, we are there also, to, to help them and to give them solutions for this kind of, of problems, then I will get this kind of fence, the new dogs, the new systems, the new, the new whatever, um, uh, options that I have to avoid this kind of conflicts. Okay, okay. Thank you, Louis. Um, Rebecca, would you, would you like to comment on this as well, or a, a, another conflict? You know, or um, there could be uh, uh, different interests in, in in play when we're talking hunting, uh, for instance. Um, is is that something you would like to comment on? Um, I mean, the context in Britain in terms of conflict, I mean, one thing is we've had no top predators in Britain for so long that people just aren't, aren't used to living alongside predators in the way that they might be in some parts of, of Europe and, and the US. Um, so that creates an issue in itself. Uh, and our whole farming systems, like the way that 
Um, we heard sheep, for instance, isn't used to the fact that there might be wolves or lynx in the woodlands. Um, uh, and our, our whole way of hunting in Britain is completely different as well. You know, we have uh, practically farmed landscapes in, in our, our grouse moors and our deer stalking estates that are completely degraded of, of wildlife, wildlife and biodiversity, but um, full of the animals that one might want to hunt. So, so there is conflict there. There's conflict with, with farmers in terms of, well, well um, conflict is not so much the word as, I think there's a, the debate has been polarized up until now, partly because part, some farmers and farmers in the uplands in particular see it as a threat to their to their, to their livelihood, to their cultural heritage, and to their way of, of um, farming the land. Um, but I think there, again, there's more recently been a real shift uh, and, and move towards finding common ground, because there is a significant amount of, of common ground between those who manage the land, between rewilders, between conservationists. It's about bringing everyone together and saying, what are we asking of the land and sea? Uh, today and for the future and how do we have to change the way that we manage the land and sea um, mm -hmm. for the good of everyone. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, we, we have still other interesting questions but um, looking at the time we have to move on. I'd like to announce now that we have our second Slido question, that is the poll question coming up. Um, and the question is as follows, and we will come back to this question at the end of our session. The question is, how can we increase the impact and scale of rewilding efforts worldwide? So uh, you see the screen now, the Slido screen. Um, and by the way, we have about 500 uh, attendees. So we'd love to get your input on this. Um, it is quite obvious that we have to scale up our efforts um, in, in, in the next coming years. And uh, if you look at the, the program of rewilding Britain, for instance, again, I'm very happy with that ambition. And uh, I hope, thanks to a Green Deal coming up and, uh, and the plans of the European Commission, that's how we can scale this up on, on a European level, at, at least in the, in the European Union. Um, so, I would like, yes, you're reacting on that uh, already very well. Um, I'd like to give the word now to my uh, good colleague, Marijke Brune, who will uh, host the second part of our session uh, with uh, two fantastic funders of rewilding, one at the, from the private end uh, being uh, conservation capital, and the other from the public and being Stephanie Lindenberg of the European Investment Bank. Um, please have my seat and uh -huh. uh, we'll be back. Uh -huh. Warm welcome everyone in the session today. We are extremely privileged to, uh, to host also here the European Investment Bank and also Conservation Capital. Um, I would like to present Stephanie Win Lindenberg from the Natural Capital Finance Facility and Giles Davis, founder and CEO of the Conservation Capital, managing impressive projects in Africa and in Europe as well. So please, Stephanie, can I uh, ask you to take the floor? Yes, hello, everyone. Um, can you see me? <coughs> Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Marike, for the introduction. I would also like to, to share a couple of uh, slides with you. Let me just bring them up. Can you see my slides? <clears throat> yes, it's very clear from right. here. Can you, yes, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. So um, I'm very humbled to be on, on this panel with uh, such very impressive uh, practitioners. And I will speak about a slightly more dull project about uh, financing, uh, financing rewilding. 
especially from our perspective, from the perspective of my, the institution I work for, uh, from the European Investment Bank. And um, I want to speak about a product that we have, which allows financing rewilding projects. It's called Natural Capital Finance Facility. And then I want to throw in a couple of ideas on how we can fi uh, scale up financing uh, for rewilding projects. Um, and as I said, we have one product in particular, it's called the Natural Capital Finance Facility, which allows financing projects which promote biodiversity and rewilding projects. But before I speak about this product or give you a bit, a bit of an insight on, on this, I would like to say a few words on the institution I work for. It's called the European Investment Bank. We call ourselves the EU Bank. Our shareholders, our owners are the EU member states. And um, our mandate is to implement EU policies. Traditionally, we have been financing a lot of large infrastructure. And um, therefore, the natural capital finance facility is a bit of an outlier and also new for us. So let me talk a bit about this, let's call it financial product that we have. As I said, the idea of this product is to finance projects in Europe that promote biodiversity. And I give you the key facts about it. It's mm -hmm. a financial instrument that was set up by the European Investment Bank and uh, the European Commission. We provide debt and equity. So we can provide loans or we can contribute to a fund. And we have um, another component in this uh, product, which is technical assistance. And this is grant based. So we have two components, really. One is um, repayable finance. And I emphasize that because it's often a misunderstanding. So we offer finance, but it has to be paid back. And the other one is a grant-based um, component, technical assistance to support the projects in the development, uh, which does not have to finance uh, to be uh, paid back. The instrument is currently in a, a pilot phase that runs until 2021 but I'm sure that there will be something following uh, this, this instrument that can then also finance such projects. Um, we can finance projects which have to have a minimum size or need at least 5 million and a maximum of 50 million. Mm -hmm. We can provide loans, as I said, directly to a project or to a, to a national bank um, that then can on lend. Um, and then we can participate in funds. We can never finance 100% of a project. We can only finance a maximum of 75% of a project. Mm -hmm. We can finance private entities, commercial entities, NGO, NGOs or public entities, like for example, a municipality. Mm -hmm. And then again, we have the technical assistance component uh, with which we can support each product, project with up to 1 million grant financing. Uh, and the idea is really that these projects are relatively new. They need uh, support in the development, in the setting up. So we can support them in, in a wide range of aspects, reaching from uh, advice on legal, legal aspects, uh, on commercial aspects, on technical aspects, on uh, questions as monitoring, monitoring the impacts of the investments that uh, are made. And now I would like to give you just a few examples of what uh, of the projects we have financed so far. And the project that comes really closest to what we are speaking of today, rewilding, is um, a loan to Rewilding Europe Capital. It's a microfinance institution which was set up by the NGO Rewilding Europe. Many of you might know them, or some of them might be on, on uh, listening today. And um, the NGO has, um, I think, nine regions across Europe in which they work together with so-called nature uh, focused businesses. And these businesses um, work with nature and a share of their income goes towards the conservation of the areas they're working in and from which they, they benefit and base their, their businesses on. And it's um, everyone who doesn't know it, I really recommend uh, g visiting their website and um, uh, having a look. It's a, it's a great project. But we also have other projects, for example, we have financed a, for, a forestry fund in Ireland, which moves from the uh, clear, clear felling uh, method to continuous covers forestry and introducing a number of um, 
other aspects to maximize biodiversity in Irish forests. Mm -hmm. We have also, and I chosen this, um, a project where we on lend to a national bank in Croatia, um, and they lend to um, <clears throat> natural nature-based um, businesses, um, ecotourism businesses, um, businesses that uh, use natural or produce natural, some kind of natural products. Um, and we have done that because this allows the bank in Croatia to online smaller amounts than we are able to lend. So far to what we have done so far, what the NCFF is, please don't hesitate to any, ask any questions uh, if this was too quick. Um, on rewilding, we would love to finance more rewilding projects and we would like to see more rewilding projects come to us. And, um, but they have their peculiarity and their, their well, they're, they're special characteristics, and I would just like to speak about a, a few, uh, not too long, and then about from 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 these characteristics, uh, I would like to move on to what I think we need to do to scale up the financing in this area. Mm -hmm. um, from a project perspective, what does rewilding mean? I mean, we have heard a lot. What does rewilding? mean, but it means from activities, cost items, it means, for example, removing old infrastructure like dikes or dams, as we see here on the left. It means reintroducing species. But in particular, it means letting nature take over to itself. And for that, we need land. And we need to purchase land or we need to acquire the rights to land. And um, this is something that, for example, my institution, we cannot purchase land. It's in our statutes. We cannot do it. However, we can finance um, the removal of infrastructure, reintroduction of species. Um, and then, of course, we need some businesses around uh, rewilding. As many of you already said, I think it was Rebecca, we need to think how, how people, how we can, how nature and people can, can work to, together. Um, because we also need someone who, who uh, repays those investments that we are financing. Because as I said before, we are not a philanthropic institution. We are not providing grants like the European Commission or other public entities. We are, pay, uh, we are providing repayable financing. So we need businesses and they have the, the, the difficult task to generate revenues for themselves, but also for the investments that were made into rewilding if you want to bring them into the equation. So from my side and from my view as a funder, what needs to be done or the path really to scaling up is a, we need to work together, together as funders. We all have different strengths. We have different strings attached to our financing. As I said, we can never finance 100% of a project. We can, for example, not finance land at the moment. We can finance almost everything else. This means we can finance um, activities which are, however, not very cost intensive. Therefore, we need to work together with entities on the ground who can aggregate those projects who bring a lot of these projects to us so that we can make a financeable project out of it. We need entities who have people in there with financial uh, know-how. Often um, the projects that come to us, um, we, we meet uh, people who, have, who are excellent conservation experts, uh, biologists who are very passionate about their, their projects, but they lack the financial know-how. And then there is a friction between those entities who come to us and us and because we don't speak the same, same language. So we need, uh, within the institutions on the, or the entities working on the ground, people who are financially literate and to know how to deal with a bank and who know how to take on financing. And then, of course, we need, <clears throat> finally, more businesses who have nature as a focus and who want to, to work, who want to contribute to, to rewilding and make a living from this. And finally, of course, we need the conservation experts who tell us uh, what to do. But um, what I would really like to, to stress, what I think is missing at the moment is um, entities on the ground who are aggregating these projects and bring projects to us that have the right size for us and other finances, and to bring in financial experts people who are financially literate into the, the people who are doing the great work on the ground and developing the rewilding projects so that we both speak the same language and can set up 
projects that can be financed by our institution and other institutions uh, or uh, financiers. Wonderful. That's it from my side, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I've got a lot of questions coming up, but uh, since we are have a small time uh, challenge, so I would like to give the floor to to you. Ciao. Ciao. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'm not saying wrongly. Thank you so much. Giles, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I think the host needs to enable me to uh, start my video. There we go. Um, thank you, Marika, and um, good evening, everyone, from a, a very wet um, position on the equator in Kenya. But the um, the arrival of the range is always a, a welcome thing in in this part of Africa. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about just it's a, a few issues um, relevant to financing rewilding. Um, I don't have time here to go through all the different types of mechanisms, so I'll just pick out a few themes. Um, on this slide, I hope you can all see it. Um, there is indeed a list of, of, of the different types of mechanisms that you might be able to use to, to, to finance rewilding. Um, grants, philanthropy, endowments, through to green taxes, debt for nature swaps, payment for ecosystem services, bonds, impact investing, enterprise mechanisms, or even outcome-based financing. Mm -hmm. um, they all have their own characteristics. They're all tools that should be considered by any rewilding practitioner. Um, but just one thing I want to draw out from that is that any rewilding practitioner, when they're thinking about financing for rewilding projects, should draw some distinctions. They should draw some distinctions between mechanisms which are pure financing mechanisms, those which are essentially involve collating capital into a pot to be used for a particular purpose. That examples would be endowments um, in the not-for-profit space, uh, conservation bonds in the for-profit space, conservation trust funds, um, impact funds, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the you know, creation of a capital pot is one thing that people should be thinking about. And that should be distinctive from revenue mechanisms. Revenue mechanisms might be things like payment for ecosystem services or biodiversity offsets, carbon offsets, or user fees, where it's more about creating an annuity stream, a continual flow of revenue that can support rewilding activity. And then finally, enterprise or commercial enterprise um, mechanisms. And we've heard a bit about that already. Um, enterprises in themselves might be a generator of revenue. Uh, they might be, might be a, a target for financing from these financing mechanisms. Um, but they can also have some sort of non-pure financing effects. They can, they can be used to create incentives for local communities, um, particularly so they're nature-based. Um, to, to facilitate or support rewilding. And they may even just operate in a way that's, that's, that facilitates rewilding using processes or technologies which um, reduce pressure on, on natural landscapes, for example. So I think when you're thinking about the firmament of options in financing, try, try to draw a distinction between pure financing mechanisms versus revenue mechanisms versus uh, the use of nature-based enterprise to support, to support rewilding endeavor. Just going back to this table, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but what I've tried to do here is, 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 is um, assess to what extent these different types of mechanism tend to be more suited to public finance versus being more suited to private finance. Um, and they all have different dynamics in this regard. But I think the key point that I want to draw out from here is that um, most of them have well, the opportunity for combinations of both. Uh, and I think if um, uh, rewilding and the financing of rewilding and clearly money and rewilding are pretty key uh, or is a key constraint or key opportunity, um, you, you really need a partnership or there's a lot of opportunity rather for partnerships between uh, public sources of financing and private sources of fi financing. You often hear now about public-private partnerships in many aspects of life, including conservation or rewilding, uh, but we should also be thinking about public-private financing partnerships as well. Um, something kind of linked to that is the whole issue of blended finance. Um, again, you, know, you don't need to think about grant finance entirely separately from um, an investment fund, the kind of capital that, that Stephanie would provide. You can often mix the two 
uh, to, to create mutually supportive um, opportunities in financing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Um, no, sorry, I'm not quite complete. Just one second, Marika. Um, just, just a couple of other quick slides. Um, Rebecca had a slide that said, you know, what is rewilding? And, and the definition of rewilding is pretty key to, to financing. Um, you, you tend to get in, in rewilding contexts you know, quite purist definitions, uh, which will involve a greater degree of social and economic exclusion from a rewilding area. So perhaps might be what, what, what might be termed more pragmatic um, definitions where you have a high, higher degree or even a high degree of social and economic integration into a rewilding context. I, I guess the point of this slide is really just to say that if you're looking at those very pure or core rewilding definitions, uh, mm -hmm. there will definitely be scope um, for, for financing, uh, but it's perhaps more limited uh, than in the more, more pragmatic um, um, context. So this line here doesn't start at the bottom, it starts halfway up. But the more pragmatic, the more you're able to introduce the idea of nature-based businesses, you're able to use, um, uh, allow either businesses or people to access wild, uh, rewilding areas, you start to bring into play more commercial opportunities for financing, conservation bond, impact investment funds, user fees, et cetera, et cetera. So the definition of rewilding um, in any particular rewilding context will be a determined to some extent about the amount of financing optionality that practitioners have. Mm -hmm. Just one final slide, right, if I may, is oh. I often, often wonder about the, the distinction between conservation and rewilding. Um, mm -hmm. I was brought up and operate mainly in Africa where I tend to think of myself as a conservationist, but I've had the great good fortune to work with um, uh, re rewilding Europe, um, primarily on the European continent. Um, and was, was uh, quite intimately involved in the establishment of Rewilding Europe Capital, which uh, Stephanie said earlier on. Um, we've also had the, the, the privilege of working with Rebecca in Britain. Um, I, I think conservation as a whole tends to be more about defending value. Rewilding may be thought about more about rebuilding value. To some extent, that's a bit generalist this, but uh, conservation tends to be a more of a de developing nation-focused discipline versus developed nation discipline rewilding uh, and conservation is perhaps an older discipline i mean obviously they're very very closely linked but i think that practitioners of rewilding and particularly when it comes to financing and particularly commercial financing for um or for profit where you have to pay the money back as stephanie said uh, there's it's one of the perhaps rare areas where the developed world and where rewilding is more prevalent can can really learn from the developing nations where i think uh, we've had to do this for longer perhaps in more challenging context and and develop some pretty pretty creative uh, methodologies for that. So uh, we should be sharing a lot of lessons when it comes to rewilding across the conservation and rewilding space. Um, I'll stop just finally to, 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 to really emphasize, uh, I don't have a slide on this, but a couple of points that Stephanie made. Um, the, the, it's very difficult to raise finance at scale for, for small individual projects. And so any organization and Rewilding Europe Capital tried to do this or is doing this, um, as, as I think Stephanie's slide said, there's now 30 projects there. You need to aggregate projects so that you can target larger amounts of, of finance from, from single sources. You need to be very, very conscious of risk. Uh, financiers like Stephanie are very risk conscious. That's the whole way private sector finance has been, has learned to be so efficient. And then the issue of financial literacy is a really key point, uh, again, that came up in the prior presentation. You need to, for, practitioners need to learn to, to, to present projects and present value propositions in ways um, that financiers and banks um, are comfortable with. Um, so I really just echo Stephanie's points in some of those, key, some of those dynamics that she raised on her final slide. Um, I'll stop there, Marika. Thank you so much, Giles. It was very interesting for both of you to present to us those uh, innovative financing uh, instruments. And uh, I'm sure that we will take that further in the next uh, couple of months. It's extremely interesting that you present uh, and, and urged uh, the parties that are working with the wilding that they that they are forced to present commercially viable business cases and that we move away from philanthropy, from grants, of course, always in combination, but it's fantastic that both in public and private sector, 
There are so, so many new instruments coming up to finance rewilding biodiversity. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, I had a question to, um, to Stephanie. I was wondering, do, does the bank uh, work in like say procurement rounds or is it also possible to submit, let's say uh, business proposals uh, during the year? Or are you working with a fixed agenda of uh, procurement rounds? No, you can uh, you can submit a project at any time at any time of the year. There are no fixed rounds like uh, you see it, for example, with the European Commission for for life grant funding. Mm -hmm. Just uh, one comparison. No, so the the answer is you can submit a project at any time of the year uh, mm -hmm. that you you would like, and we are happy to to receive your proposals. Okay, and and do you uh, use specific impact standards for measurement impact? Uh, in the area of rewilding or in conservation, how does the bank cope with those challenges? Whether we use a specific, uh, sorry, I didn't get you. Um, uh, we use a specific like balanced scorecards or a measurement of modules for measuring impact on specific product proposals. No. To, let's say no, to we really, th this is up, sorry. This is up to each project to, to make a proposal how at the moment, how they want to measure the impact. And we right. follow most of the time their, their proposal. Okay, thank you very much. I have got two interesting questions uh, from, um, um, from the audience. Uh, thank you so much for that. One is from Bas Knoll. How can rewilding be financed and what is in there both financially and non-financially? Giles, can I pass this question to you? Sorry, Marika, could you just repeat that question? I didn't quite hear it. My yes. apologies. How can rewilding be financed and what is in there both financially and non-financially? It's more a general question, I think, and you touched upon that in your, in your slide. Yeah, I guess if I understand the question rightly, in terms of how can rewilding be financed, Mm -hmm. um, I would say that, um, from my perspective, our experience is more is more from the um, is more on the the kind of commercial financing side as opposed to grants and philanthropy, which, by the way, are super important um, yeah. in their own context, particularly for those those purer um, purer uh, sort of definitions of rewilding. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, again, it's about in a world where, pop, well, certainly in the developing world, but, but where, you know, there's more and more human impact, more and more people. Um, you know, I think that rewilding has to adopt that more integrationist approach, um, look at ways of embracing uh, the, the presence of nature-based uh, businesses and enterprises to, you know, in rewilding context to support rewilding context. And the more you bring in uh, profitable businesses, um, the more you open up opportunities for um, uh, non-grant based finance to, 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 to play a role. Um, and as many people on this call will know, we, we face a chronic shortage of funding for conservation or rewilding overall. Um, it's between a billion and a couple of billion dollars a day in, in terms of the shortfall. And that's never going to be bridged by by the by traditional grant um, or, or sources or philanthropy. Mm -hmm. um, but so our view would be that you know, commercial finance needs to play a bigger role. Um, and uh, we would, you know, I think it's it's, it's necessary. We're, we're, listen, we all love pure wildernesses, uh, all of us. Um, but it may not always be practically possible, and you may need to bring in tourism. You may need to build in sustainable, bring in sustainable agriculture. You may need to build in sustainable sources of energy, commercialize those. And once you do that, if those businesses operate in a way which is good for nature rather than um, bad for nature, and they can be if they're not structured properly, you open up a whole new world of financing. So um, I hope I've interpreted the question right, but that, that would be that would be one of the my, my main mechanisms, and that's why rewilding Europe, um, which did uh, and does a lot of what I call very pure rewilding, uh, species introduction, land acquisition, or, or sec you know, securitizing land. 
Um, but that's why Rewilding Europe Capital was developed. And, um, and it's an exciting, it's an exciting evolution. And it, it brings in the European Investment Bank uh, as a financing partner. That would not have been possible without that more economic, so economically integrationist approach. Yes, I fully agree. It's again, absolutely crucial to develop this sector and, uh, and contrib contribute to that. Thank you so much, Charles. I've got a, co a question for Stephanie, actually. Um, well, two people uh, pose more or less the same question, Christine and Andrea uh, Salcedo. I hope I pronounced this correctly. Um, Stephanie, do you, um, what returns do you look for? Uh, are there certain criteria um, how do you, uh, that you use to select, for example, investments? What are your standard criteria? What is the bank's standard mo model to evaluate business proposals? Can you elaborate? <clears throat> First of all, I have to say I'm, I'm not on the um, operational, on the financing side myself. I'm more on the technical side uh, of the project. So I can, I, and we do not have a standard uh, that we would ask as a return. It really depends on uh, many different aspects of how the project is set up and how um, also the trust we have in, in the entity we work with. So it's, there's no standard rate of return that uh, I, I could uh, mention here. That we would expect. Okay, thank you so much. Um, then there is another question, uh, I think, for Rebecca um, by Christine Radcliffe. She loved your presentation and she asked whether you see a role for private sector, particularly private finance and investments. Rebecca, um, are you there? Yes, yes I'm here. Uh, um, Absolutely. I mean, I, I agree with Giles in that we need to take a pragmatic approach um, and there's a place to play for everyone, for the corporate sector, for the um, private landowners, for public landowners. Um, and we need, I think it, I think what's key is that we need to um, take a, an integrated kind of approach to to land use, develop land use strategies on large scales and then increasingly regional and local scales so that we take coordinated action and don't think about land as in here we do farming, here we do um, forestry, here we do fishing, a bit of tourism over there, but how can we look at an area um, and define what's, what's the, again, what are we asking of the land and see and how do we best use the resources that we have to, to contribute, produce food, to um, to enhance nature biodiversity and and then the financing mechanisms need to come in on that so we take a, a coordinated approach because at the moment we've got I think we've got a scattergun approach and certain certain activities are supported through certain funding mechanisms and other activities through others and they're not mutually supportive. Okay thank you very much. Well, um, once again, uh, Stephanie and Giles, thank you so much for your valuable con to, uh, contribution to our session. I could talk for hours on this because I, uh, it's uh, highly impressive what you have developed and how you can boost uh, the, uh, the, the uh, nice and impressive initiatives uh, further. Um, I would like to take the floor to Fido again. Thank you so much. And we move on to the next part. Thank you. Hello everyone, <clears throat> there we are again. Um, I know in Corona time, we're not supposed to sit this close together, <laughs> but I tell you one thing, True Nature Foundation is a family. So, and I understand our regulators <laughs> say, uh, we, we can do so, as long as you're a family uh, unit. Anyhow, um, we're coming to the uh, last bit of our session and it is way too short. I mean, it's it's very clear, and we have a lot of questions unanswered from the public, um, which is a pity. Um, and um, I, they are registered, and we we can follow up uh, in in a written way on your questions, and we will um, and we will liaise with our speakers on. Um, on that so that all questions get an answer. I mean, um, that would be um, that would be something we'd like to do. Um, what we 
want to do in the last 15 minutes of the session we have now is to bring everyone, practitioners and funders of uh, rewilding together and, uh, and um, around one key question and that is how as you answer that question to some extent already for your beautiful island, um, Rebecca, but how, how can we worldwide scale up rewilding projects over the next 10 years and how do we increase the impact of these projects together? And I think it, it has to come from both ends and um, some uh, some remarks were made already in this in this regard, but how can we scale up and increase our impact over the next ten years um, on, on 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 rewilding, both from a financial and a funders' point of view, as well as the practitioners' end? So I would like to ask all speakers um, to to address this question, starting with um, with, with you, Christina. Are you still there? Yes, of course. Yes, you're, you're holding out. Excellent. Um, so happy to have you back. Uh, so you understand the question, I suppose, huh? No. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Speaking as a, a, a funder for our own projects and also a recipient of partnerships, institutional and individual and um, I would say this to you, you, as you say, you have to start at both ends. So though imperfect, the Endangered Species Act in the United States mm -hmm. requires that there is, a, there is a higher level of protection for the species on that list. And there are funds to help uh, bring back populations where it's feasible. So at a national level, a sovereign state, you have to have the kind of laws and regulations that support this kind of work. Even though you may not be attached to that on a daily basis, you still have to have it. Because you're looking at rewilding in 50, 100, 200 years out, and that's the institutional power. Yeah. And then you have to have the, on, on the ground, you have to have teams and and, and yourselves very, very committed to the long-term project that is rewilding. Very true. I think one of the simplest things we do is to actually acquire land. Some cases we, you buy it and you sign the check and you've got the land, but that's the easiest thing anyone does. The rewilding of a place, as I said earlier, requires the territory to do it in that is stable and protected. It requires ourselves to, to rewild ourselves as individuals and communities. And um, it, it has to be wide scale to your, to your question. It has to be a shared sense of national global patrimony and then bring it very very rapidly down to the local level that for economic reasons for reasons of pride and community dignity and all sorts of reasons mm -hmm. those things have to be present to achieve successes long term in terms of rewilding in my opinion all right mm. thank you thank you uh, rebecca um I'm sure you have some ideas on this topic as well. I mean, I I don't have an, an awful lot to add in terms of I and I completely agree with the Chris, with Chris. It's a it's a it's a combined it's a combination of kind of government led action and we can influence government because supposedly they're acting on our behalf, um, plus coordinated <laughs> locally led action. Um, built through, you know, a movement for change. And we have, I mean, one thing we haven't mentioned um, in in the last hour or a bit is the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, in light of, of that, we ca cannot let it happen in vain. Um, there's a huge upsurge in, in interest and desire to 
um, to address the climate and ecological emergencies, partly because of COVID and, and, and the way that we, we know that one of the factors in causing it was the relationship we have with the natural world. So I think we, we have to, as, as citizens and individuals, ensure that the, the, the massive amounts of investment that is going to happen post-COVID to you know, kickstart economies um, happens in a way, you know, it's, it's a green recovery and it is a, a nature positive and climate positive recovery. Um, so that's, uh, that would be my plea, I think. Okay, thank you. Lewis, you got any thoughts on this uh, topic? Well, can you hear me? Ah. Yes, I'm here. Yes. Uh -huh. Well, yes. Um, as what can we do uh, to to increase the the yeah. impact of the of rewilding? Well, uh, Chris was talking about yeah. Uh, about working with, with with the communities and so and, and Rebecca spoke about the, the government and all of this is true but how can we push forward these communities and governments to to get this for me the the key right now is um is to to make the people understand what are we doing now and what are our achievements you know uh, 10 years ago nobody was speaking about rewilding and and even when it's a, a much older concept but now everybody's talking and then there's a great momentum about, about rewilding. People is talking about this and so. And as you told me a lot of times, dear Guido, once the sheep gets in the dike, all the rest of the sheep will, will follow her. You know, if we make good, um, good rewilding projects, and I'm a great fan of the, of the Chris uh, work. I'm following uh, her work from, from some years ago and, and other um, rewilding projects that are, for example, in, in England. And I think that there's uh, um, that those are great projects because it brings um, richness to the communities, improves the the environment, get uh, CO2 trapped in the soil, and gets a lot of those benefits. But the people doesn't know it. We need to be sure that the people know what are we doing and what is required. And we and for this we must show the good results of the of the current projects that are uh, that are doing all around the world. And I'm completely sure that once the people know it's exactly the same as you and I and, and, and most of the people who are hearing us right now, um, the people will realize that this is a positive um, topic, not only for, um, for the environment and the climate change, but also for, for human beings. Uh, just one practical question. So actually you say we need the media to convey the messages we, we'd like to get out on Rewind. Uh, how do we do that? I, I, I think Christine has a... You, you run projects who are really mind-blowing, you know? So uh, I notice, I, I find your story everywhere and I, I'm happy. Uh, I'm very happy with that. I mean, you're promoting not only your own projects with it, but the whole concept of rewilding mm -hmm. at the same time. Um, so I think we really need champions, and in my eyes, you are a champion of rewilding. Um, are, are there any other ways we can we can involve the media and get our our stories and our message out and about the necessity of the of the scaling up of our projects? Uh, anyone who likes to comment on that? I, I will. I, I think the media is hungry for these stories. Mm -hmm. I, I I can't think of any place around the globe where um, when we wanted to get a story out about a specific problem or success with a particular project or the concept of rewilding, um, looking at it broadly, I, I think they're dying for this kind of content because the optics of them are extraordinary and and the stories involve local heroes and villains and and uh projects that have been incredibly frustrating and costly but finally you know it's like a, the end of a good love story it works out i i think that people working in in rewilding i we see press and films and all sorts of things as part of the work. We don't distinguish between 
uh, I hate the word marketing. I'll just call it communication and the work itself. Because mm -hmm. exactly to Luis's point, we, we have to sell, and I hate, I know people don't like that word, but it's selling the experiences and the value of what success can look like for everybody. Yes. And uh, humans and non-humans. So uh, it, it's there. You don't have to reach very far before you have the kind of exposure that you might not have imagined possible beforehand. Okay, so, thank you. Um, we, we get great questions in, so I, I hope oh, we only have five minutes left. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pity. Sorry for the um, both funders because there were some questions for you too. I hope we can uh, take those questions uh, in the aftermath uh, and, uh, and uh, on a written basis. But there is one very nice question. I think we will all like that one, and that is, what have you done to rewild yourselves? And uh, so it, it is a um, question of uh, Jessica Paul of um, the Global Landscape Forum itself. I think it's a great question again. Jessica, thank you for that. Um, and we have all about 30 seconds to address that question. But let's make it a great firecracker. On the end. <laughs> so, uh, Christy, again, you have 30 seconds. What did you do to rewild yourself? I left my business career and dedicated myself to, uh, and my husband, living in isolated, very wild places. And then you begin to understand the language and the daily flow of what it means to be in the middle of someplace really wild. And for me, that's what it took. And now there's there's no going back. <laughs> I can't imagine Thank you. having a life okay. that's any uh, different than the one I've got now. Okay, excellent. Great. Rebecca, what would be your answer? What, what did you do to rewild yourself? I suppose the answer is, like many people, I seek every opportunity that I can, um, despite the fact that I live in a, a, a semi-urban area and uh, within the constraints of having a small child to have experiences of nature and, and experience the profound impact that that can have. And so, for example, the last thing that pops into my mind was uh, off the west coast of Scotland, snorkeling with basking sharks. Um, so, so, yeah, seeking those experiences in, in wild nature, if, even if it's that or watching the red kites wheel above my house, um, it lifts the heart. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Lewis, just very short, because otherwise we, we have two more guests to, to couple, and we have th three minutes left. Mm -hmm. Very brief, what makes you, what do you do to rewild yourself? I know you well, uh, on the end, um, I think when I was five years old, my father found me making uh, animals with uh, plus design and I was ordering them uh, according to the ecosystem, you know? So I think I was never very tame, but to a while, well, I have been following you during almost 10 years now and, and contributing with as much as I can to do it. And now that I have a son, I'm trying him to, to be also a little piece of wild in my own life. Great, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, of course, then uh, Giles, please. Oh no, wait, sorry, Giles. It's a lady first, Stephanie. Stephanie, what would <laughs> you rewild yourself or, or, or your bank? <laughs> <laughs> no, I personally go as often as I can to to the uh, to the Alps to go hiking, and I'm thirsty for it for the rest of the year when I can't go there. And if I can't go there, I go into the forest behind my house, even if it's not spectacular. I think it's a small piece of, a, a bit of rewilding, and that's what I do, and I feel happy if I go there. <laughs> this picture of you uh, in front of beautiful Alps uh, somewhere, and I thought, yeah, that, that's a great picture, uh, especially for someone running <laughs> 
capital funding facility. Yeah. Um, last, <laughs> Giles, for you the honor to to close the session. Are you have um, one minute. What 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 do you do to rewild yourself? No, Guido. Um, well, right now I'm quite worried because uh, I've been on this call for an hour and a half and I haven't got the dogs in and there's a considerable risk of them getting eaten by a leopard. Um, so I, um, I, I live in the middle of nature. I can hear hyenas calling. I can hear an owl calling. Uh, I'm not in anywhere near Chris's league, but I too left, um, took off a suit quite early on in my life and uh, dedicated my entire life to working with nature. Uh, and then Louis mentioned his children. Um, my eldest boy is, 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 is quite good at sciences and it, wasn't, it was an easy conversation, but he's dropped mainstream scientists to study environmental systems and societies at IB. Uh, and I think that's all part of everyone and particularly the youth starting to rewild, my, rewild themselves because uh, you know, we can talk about legislation, governments, uh, money, but in, unless you know, it came, a look, came up a lot on this, unless we rewild ourselves uh, at, at different levels, um, we're not going to get where we need to be. Right. Okay. Well, every everyone, all, all speakers, I I thank you from the bottom of our heart. Um, I think we had a, we had a, we had a great discussion, um, and uh, it only tastes to more. I mean, this is a literal translation of, of Dutch, but uh, I hope you get what I try to say. Um, I would like to continue one way or another this, this discussion, both um, uh, between practitioners and funders and amongst funders and, and practitioners. We, we'll see how we can follow up on this right for now. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a, it was a privilege and an honor to have you in, uh, in this session. And thank you to the public for uh, attending this one. Um, I think, and I'm looking at my colleague here, if we have a Slido outcome on the on the question, no, unfortunately not. We will share that um, uh, in a written way. Thank you once again, and uh, hope to see you next time. Bye-bye now from the Netherlands and True Nature Foundation. <laughs>